I am going to call this meeting to order. It is 6 o'clock p.m. This is a regular uh, school board meeting of the Tri-C United School Board. It is Monday, December 10th, 2018, and we are located at the TCU High School Band Room. Um, roll call finds all present except for Kevin Huber is absent this evening. And next we'll move into our truth and taxation meeting. Well, hello everyone, um, Superintendent Preisler, board members, and our, our viewing public. Um, my name is Jean Kep. I'm the Director of Business Services for Tri-City United. And we are here tonight for the Truth and Taxation public meeting. Great. So our agenda for this meeting is I'll review the Truth and Taxation Law. We will review the 18 payable 19 levy. Um, we'll discuss the 19 adopted budget and we'll review the resolution that will be brought to the board later in this meeting. So the Truth and Taxation Law is Minnesota Statute 275.06 and this law requires that cities, counties, and school districts follow certain steps before adopting a tax levy for the following year and those requirements are to mail a notice to each property owner in the county that describes the tax levies proposed and presents the dollar impact of the levy percent increase or decrease. So that would be the proposed tax statement that our property owners would get from um, the counties. The second is to hold a public meeting, which is why I'm here today. So we'll discuss the proposed property tax levy, provide and discuss information on the current budget, and to give a reasonable amount of time for comments or questions. So our 18 pay 19 levy, um, variables that could impact the property taxes um, are changes in assessed market value, <coughs> classifications, or class rates. So the assessed value of your property may increase or decrease. The assessed value of all the other properties may increase or decrease. Um, the total number of properties may change. Um, any of these examples could impact your property's share of our total tax base. Uh, changes in state funding formulas may increase or decrease levy amounts, and there may be changes in property tax credits. So the levy cycle is a three-year cycle. Um, it's certified in calendar 2018, starts in July, and the school board, it's brought to the school board in December, so that's what we're here today for. Um, it's paid by our taxpayers in calendar year 2019, and the school receives the funds from the county in 2019. But this is fiscal year 20 revenue, so we make financial accounting adjustments to recognize the revenue in fiscal year 20. So our 18 payable 19 levy, <clears throat> the overview here. The school, I'm requesting the school board approval of a 2018 payable 19 levy in the amount of $6,549,452. So that's a change of $1,063,076 or 19.38%. If we review by fund, um, the general fund, which provides for instructional programs, facility maintenance, uh, retirement obligations, operating capital, and building land and leases, is $2,146,776, which is a change of $11,665. <clears throat> the community service fund, which community service levy, which is for our community education programs, is for $147,598 which is an increase of $2,602. And our debt service levy, which is for repayment of principal and interest on district debt, is $4,255,078, which is an increase of $1,048,809. So I'll provide a breakout of the general and debt service funds on the coming pages. All right, so this slide on the top left is a review again of last year's general fund levy in this year's general fund levy and the increase. The chart on the right is a waterfall to explain um, what's changing year over year in our levies. So first we'll talk about the increases. So what I want to point out to you is the third column in the table on the bottom is this label called equalized. And equalized is important because it means we get a portion of our funding from local funds and a portion, portion of our funding from the state. Um, so any reduction in our local levy would result in a loss of state funding. So we generally don't want to under levy in these categories um, because we would lose state funding. So the first category is equity. Um, this is a 70-30 state to local equalized 
Um, the increase is driven by a change in state formula intended to better align rural district and metro district resources. The second bar in green, so green is increases to the levy, red is decreases to the general fund levy, um, is also, op is also um, equalized. Its a ratio is variable and impacted by the district's net tax capacity and the increase is driven by a fluctuation in the state local levy ratio. The third bar is achievement and integration. So this is a new levy category for Tri-City United. Um, TCU qualifies as an adjacent district to Faribault School District, which is identified by MDE as a racially isolated school. And this is an equalized levy category, meaning it's both local and state funded. It's a 70-30 split. So 70 from the state, 30 from local. Um, and the, so the district will receive an additional $105,000 of state funding as a result of this levy item. Um, this funding can be used to supplement, not supplant, current programming that pursues um, racial and economic integration, increase student achievement, and reduce academic disparities. The next bar is CTE. This is also equalized. Um, and the increase is driven partially by a change to the state local levy ratio and partially by expansion of TCU CTE um, certified programming, so career and technical education. The last increase bar is adjustments or other. So because we make these levy assumptions based largely on enrollment and formulas, so number of students times a dollar amount, um, any change to our actual levy for our actual enrollment from estimated will we'll end up having adjustments. So that's very typical that we'll have adjustments in a levy year. Um, so if we go to decreases, we had two large decreases this year, the first being in other post-employment benefits. So this is based on actuarial estimates. Um, it's funding requirements driven by actuarial estimates for our district's liabilities. Um, and the decrease was driven by a change in eligible staff population. The second decrease bar is LTFM. So the LTFM category is intended to fund deferred capital expenditures and maintenance to prevent further erosion of facilities. Um, this decline is a shift from the general fund to the debt service fund. Um, that was, is the result of bonding our future LTFM revenue to allow for larger scale LTFM projects to take place during construction. So this previous year we approved the, the Series 2013B bond and that was money that we basically essentially borrowed from our future LTFM revenue to do larger projects, in particular the second portion of the La Center roof. Um, while we had roofers up, or up there doing the um, portion of the proof, roof that was approved during the referendum. Um, so that's a shift. We'll see that on our next slide. I don't have a slide for community service because the increase is small and there's not a single driver to, to discuss. So the debt service fund increase, so this is a slim, similar slide. You'll see the top left last year's levy, this year's levy, and the changes in the waterfall chart. Um, so obviously the largest is our series 2018B, 2018A bond. So pay 19 is the first fiscal levy year to include series 2018A bond, uh, which is the result of the passage of the two question voter referendum in February 2018. So this is intended to fund our construction projects and is is currently funding our construction projects. So that was an increase of uh, 1.1 million dollars to our levy. Um, the second bar is the LTFM, so this is where I was saying it's a shift. So because we're using it, that LTFM money for construction, we get the money in this fund and we take the money out of this fund, so just a shift. And the final bar I'll discuss is we did have a reduction in our Series 2010A bond um, so that's slightly offsetting some of these other increases. Great. So how does this levy compare to our previous years? This is a chart of um, TCU's historical, five years of historical, um, or four years of historical levies. So the 19.4% in 18 pay 19 is driven by the addition of the voter approved series 2018 ABON. Um, the rightmost bar, is showing a 1% uh, decline, which indicates the levy impact if the Series 2018A bond was excluded. So this Series 18A is basically setting a new normal for our district until other bonds drop off. 
how their debt drops off. Um, but this is, the, this is the first year we see it, so we see this large increase. Right. So some other considerations that will impact, uh, have taxpayer impact. Tri-City United's tax base grew approximately 10% from the previous year, driven by growth, so that's new properties, um, and reassessment of property value. Uh, and then we also wanted to really take a close look at the impact of the 2018 bond referendum on our taxpayers this year and, and assure that what we had communicated throughout the run up to the vote was accurate. So we did complete reviews of multiple properties to validate the tax impact and did find them to have been accurate. Um, one thing that's important for, folk, for taxpayers to remember is that our 2018 bond referendum um, impact was calculated on pay 17. So at the time we were preparing communications um, and preparing the materials, we didn't have pay 18. We only had pay 19, so it was based on pay 17, or sorry, we only had pay 17, so it was based on pay 17 assessments um, and the pay 17 tax base. Um, so it's important to remember we're kind of leapfrogging a year and then the other piece that's important is pay 18 was the first year of the ag to school tax credit. This impacts ag land only, but this was a credit for existing and future bond, um, existing, this was a credit for ag land um, for payment on existing and future school bonds. And that went into effect in 2018. So that happened, uh, people saw that on their tax statements last year, but didn't see the impact of the bond until this year. So kind of has to be a three year look to really see it. Um, and that is, that credit is um, currently set to continue in perpetuity um, and would require a full legislative action and governor approval for that to change. So our adopted budget was approved by the school board on June, 8, June 11th, 2018. And the budget cycle, we're always kind of in three years on the budget cycle, so it's adopted, it must be adopted by June 30th, so that, ha that took place in fiscal 18. We're in 19 right now, fiscal 19 right now, um, we'll, we typically do a revised budget in early spring, that would also require board approval, and then we're audited in fiscal 20, so the audit starts in, basically starts in June and continues through November, and you'll hear the results of um, fiscal year 18 later tonight. Okay, so this is a breakout by fund of our fiscal year 19 adopted budget. Um, the ending fiscal year 19 balance is showing 22.6 million, which would be a year annual decrease of 15 million, 15.5 million. So this is the first budget where we see the return of fund six, which is our construction budget. Um, and the inclusion of fund six has a dramatic impact on our total fund balance and the change to the fund balance. So you'll see that the, we estimate a set $14.7 million decline in fund six. That's for construction expenditures that are taking place um, this year. Um, but we also are projecting a deficit spend in fund one. Um, there are a few factors to consider with this budget, which is it's created when we don't know fiscal year 7, 18 actual, so it's created on a revised budget. So the starting line will change, um, then our revenues and expenditures, and that will impact the um, ending balance. So another view here, the table on the left is a breakout of our um, revenues, and the pie chart on the right is breakout of the general fund revenue sources. So. What is important to note here is that about 85% of our funding is from state, from the state, and about 10% is from local taxes, the, what we're talking about tonight, and the remainder is from federal and other local like fees or facility rental, that sort of thing. Conversely, this is a breakout of our expenditures, so, and the pie chart on the right is the general fund expenditures. So, Critical here is that we spend about 78% of our um, expenditures on staff, salary, wages, and benefits. Great. So the resolution that will be presented to the board later, I have a slide here of what, what will be brought to the board later for approval. Um, it breaks out the amount by fund and the total. 
<clears throat> so that's my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? I don't have any questions. Don't have, it's a big one with question. the levy coming on, or yeah. the, I'm sorry, the bond coming on. But hopefully the bar chart in, in there shows that without the impact of the voter approved referendum, then it really is basically a minimal change to a slight decline. Great, if there's no questions, um, this material will be posted onto the school website. Um, I also have additional slides in here with some more detailed information and I can be contacted at the business office um, if there's anyone in the community that has questions. Since this is the truth and taxation meeting, not quite sure if we're all here for that tonight, <laughs> but we are opening that up to the public for any questions or concerns that you'd have for Jean, as long as she's here. If not, we'll move on. <laughs> okay. It's a larger audience than usual. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Jean. All right. Next, we'll move on to our administrative report. As with each month, this report is available uh, through our board book for our public and for our school board members to review. Um, I do hit a few of the highlights, but encourage everyone to um, read through all of the uh, actions on the report. I'm going to begin talking, even though um, Brenda's going to be bringing it up. Oh, she's quick. Good job. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, one of the pieces within our uh, the business office, as you know, um, Jean did just give our uh, t truth and taxation. We'll be doing our audit tonight. But I want to highlight uh, an aspect that um, is being worked on with uh, Ms. Rozier. She has completed all compulsory non-public school reporting. And then we've also completed within uh, the time frames our uh, 04 birth to age 4 um, census. And that um, includes Stacy Saplucka's work. One of the things that we've done so, um, this year is a little review on how our census is, uh, how we're collecting census data, how that's translating then into our kindergarten numbers, and we're moving into a concerted um, effort to try to increase uh, public relations or uh, public notification about for people to fill out the census. So, not something that's high on people's um, radar when they move into a new community to go, oh, I probably better fill the, out the census so they know I'm here for when my child gets to be kindergarten age. So. Um, uh, Tiffany's been putting together some uh, uh, mailings and some things that can be at our hospitals, which we currently have, but this one will be much more TCU branded and really clear. Um, work with our welcome wagons, um, work with uh, various clinics, that type of thing, to really get that information out so people are more aware of the importance of completing the census. So a lot of work going on there. At TCU Montgomery, uh, I'd like to highlight some things that uh, Deb had shared. Uh, they had some uh, monthly goals, and one of the goals within the month of November was to decrease respect referrals by 5%, which they, they did as a K-6. And there, as a matter of fact, their eighth grade decreased it by 20%. So that certainly is uh, um, great news and great work there. Uh, they're also, I believe, started this last year or maybe two years ago, um, but I know it's always been a, a really big hit, is the 12 Days of Kindness and really emphasizing um, kindness to one another and everything like that. So they'll be doing that again this December 6th through the 21st. And of course, concerts are definitely uh, taking place, as we know, starting tonight. Within our special services um, department, one of the feedbacks that we've had from our paraeducators in the past was about uh, professional development, and that comes up um, even within our negotiations. And, and so we've really been intentional on um, being able to provide some professional development that's really in tune to their role in supporting our children. And Holly's done some work with that and did a session in November and will be doing again in December and had really positive feedback from our paraprofessionals on those um, trainings. We're also um, working with the Minnesota Department of Education with our early childhood special education group called Inspire Action Frameworks. And it has uh, the core components listed here. As you can tell, um, pretty entailed, but uh, it looks like to be a really strong type of opportunity to uh, strengthen our early childhood special ed programming, which across the state we are seeing increases in numbers there. 
within our communications department, uh, hopefully everyone received the district newsletter that has come out already and uh, um, Tiffany's already thinking and working on uh, the future for some promotional aspects, more singleton topic types of brochures. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to that. She's also doing some research on some um, uh, video um, production companies for some promotional videos for TCU, but just in the exploration stage with that right now. Um, Mr. Elaine Wilbright joined us on November 19th. We're glad to have him with us. Uh, he's already been out meeting people and uh, um, through our chambers and some of the multi-chamber events and, and all other kinds of things. Also working within the census area and definitely spending some real um, concerted time and getting grounded within our early childhood programming and some of the changes that will be our opportunities that will be afforded with the bond referendum building projects and expansion of classrooms. We also started a Special Olympics poly hockey program this week and uh, saw some of the kids in the uh, link area before practice and they were about as giddy as can be to get started. So uh, wonderful programs and Melissa Bell and our staff do a fabulous job within that uh, uh, opportunities for kids. At TCU High School, um, we were the juniors took the ASVAB, which is another opportunity for career interest surveys and that for our students. But uh, one that I'd like to highlight here is um, within conversations uh, happening with our staff and really doing, digging into how can we um, realign our uh, requirements and courses so that it opens up more opportunities for younger students at our high school for the elective courses. Right now it's pretty tight within 9 and 10. Not many electives happening. And those uh, districts who have really uh, been doing deep work within career, college, and life readiness one of their suggestions of best practice is try and get your ninth graders to be able to get some electives and take a look at when you're offering your careers courses. So those kinds of dialogues are happening right now. With the, uh, the other piece that occurred recently at our high school was the, um, the shift or change in the parent-teacher conferences. As you recall from last year when you approved the calendar, um, broke out the uh, second semester uh, conferences to include these personalized conferences. One of them, our first one was on December 3rd where uh, there were calls that were made to parents um, by our TCU staff um, in just kind of some informal types of feedback from what I'd heard from uh, some of our staff members is that they had, they found that they had a chance to visit with people on a, um, in a whole different realm than who shows up at conferences. So um, really emphasizes the importance of those phone calls, not just at conference time, but any time so that we're really staying in partners. At TCU La Center, and this is really fitting across all of our schools, they've been doing some deep work within uh, the MCA benchmark reports. Like I said, uh, that's been happening at all of our sites, and Matt Flugum has spent a, a great deal of time with all of our teachers with this. In particular, though, having some subouts recently with our TCU La Center teachers to dig in on those um, reports and seeing how they impact our common assessments. And finally, at TCU Lonsdale, um, they uh, ha now have a full-time Minnesota Reading Corps um, uh, position, which is great. It has been passed part-time in the past, but increased. Uh, within uh, the, this last month, their Lonsdale Leaders monthly focus was on Habit 2 of Stephen Covey's, uh, Begin with the End in Mind, and really expanding that to not only about um, planning and goal setting, but also bringing that into identifying ways that they can be good citizens and, and kindness to others. So having some emphasis there. And that is then with our food service, as Amy added in uh, some board bites. One of the things that she shared with me, um, our students had a survey on some of their favorite foods, and they are definitely seeing those on the menu this month, and I'm uh, pretty excited about that. And it sounds like pizza burgers are a pretty big hit with our junior <laughs> high age kids. So big deal. Yeah, it's always good to get student voice in those things and especially then when they see action from it. So that is our administrative report. All right, thank you very much. All right, next we'll have Ellie Singleton and Brandon Baum come on up and uh, do the high school student council report. Okay, Hi, I'm Brandon Balma. I'm our student council's vice president. I'm Ellie Singleton, and I'm the Student Council Secretary. And this past month, we have done a few things. We brought up a change, and we implemented a new passing time schedule, and we added a minute on to passing times. We also decorated a window for Montgomery Chiropractic, and 
we sent out a survey to students to see what they wanted student council to do for them and just to get out some suggestions so we can really serve the student body. Um, the passing time helped decrease the amount of backpacks used, which is a safety hazard, so that helped a lot. Um, our window was at the Montgomery Family Chiropractor, and with the Student Council Survey, we're just looking into things that the students want. And for the future, we're planning on hosting a holiday party the Friday before we go on break. We'll be doing that from Titan Time until 7th hour, just getting everyone together, getting some holiday spirit in the school. Um, we're also planning on doing a teacher breakfast sometime. In January. Yeah, sometime in January, also to celebrate the holidays. Do you want to talk about BPA? We don't really have much to talk about. I mean, I mean we usually talk about BPA. There's not much going on now. Um, right now we're just preparing for all of our events and January 9th we have our first competition regions and that will determine whether we go on to state or not. That's all. So with the survey that you guys sent out to mm -hmm. the students, what is your process on that? How do you, you did you get the results back yet? We did. Um, it was just an open-ended, two open-ended questions. One of them was what can we do to, I mean, just to better serve the population. And then the second one was, what would you like to see Student Council fund? Because Student Council is supposed to act as a funding body for the students, and a lot of people were saying clubs, pep rallies, things like that, just to get some school spirit in the school. Cool. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you both. <laughs> All right, um, next I will seek a motion to approve the agenda. So move. <coughs> second. I have a motion by Dale Buss, second by Dan Rudd to approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? <coughs> motion is passed, 6-0. Next we'll move on to our consent agenda. We have the approval of the minutes of our November 1st special school board meeting and November 13th regular school board meeting. Under personnel, we have new hires. We have Jason Hollum, our seventh grade boys basketball, boys basketball coach, which was a change uh, from a prorated season to a full season. And Shelly Naram, our, special, our early childhood special education, which was a point to increase. Under employment ending, we have Shelly Naram, Naram, a school readiness para in Lonsdale, Amy Neeson, a school readiness teacher in Montgomery, and Nicole Jacobs, our ECFE para. Under leave of absence, we have Katie Schultz, a paraprofessional at the high school. We also have our 1819 seniority list. Approval in the bills of the amount of $1,430,000, 430, 400, oh my God, I can't even say it. <laughs> $1,430,410.57. And our finance report. I will seek a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion. Second. Motion by Ashley Recibo, second by Michelle Borcher to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Motion is passed, 6-0. Next we have our Titan Pride Awards. Um, Squire, come on up. Why can I say that? I did. It's not like I can't say that. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Chrysler and board members. I am here this evening because I would like to recognize a local business and two local community organizations for their contribution to the Montgomery 7 and 8 AVID program. First of all, I would like to recognize Subway, who provided sub sandwiches for all of our students who went on a AVID field trip as well as uh, the Montgomery Lions and the Lonsdale Lions Club for their monetor monetary donation. It was with these uh, monetary dollars that we were able to purchase t-shirts for all of our AVID students. And that is really important because it will promote the AVID program within our schools as well as show unity as a group when they go out to other uh, field trips and are out in public, so we thank them. And I know that I have several of those people here this evening. 
I would like to start with the Montgomery Lions. This evening I have Mr. Walter Miller and Ms. Denise Wonder. If you could please come up this evening. Publicly, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you get to go. <laughs> Thank, thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if thank Mr. You. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Mike thank Sepchik you is here. Much. Thank you. Don't nope. <laughs> Or Mr. Dennis Langhoff. All right, so we will get these awards to them, and we greatly thank them for their contributions. Thank you, Mrs. Dwyer. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Preisler, school board members, um, it's my honor to present these five awards that I'm going to recognize tonight. First one, um, Academic All-State. For anybody that kind of uh, knows stuff about that, it's not only as a smart kid to make an Academic All-State, you have to have a major impact in both your school and your conference to receive that honor. So. Um, most programs have smart kids, but uh, to be able to be academic all-state, you have to be have a major role in obviously your team, your section, for us it's districts, and uh, obviously in this case uh, as well as the state. So first award I would like to recognize is Sam Barnack for academic all-state. The next uh, four awards I want to recognize these individuals. Um, academics is a huge part. Being involved in athletics is a major role. You have to be involved in fine arts. Very important is uh, community service and volunteer service to our school and our community. So the Minnesota State High School League, their most prestigious awards are the AAA award winners and the Excel award winners. AAA is obviously for seniors, the Excel is for juniors, but they basically recognize the same thing. Academics, fine arts, athletics, volunteer service, and community involvement. So with that, our two Excel award winners, Brandon Balma and Ellie Singleton. And our two AAA award winners are Sam Barnack and Keely Oak. Portion is the open forum por portion of the of the school board meeting. Um, during this time, I'm just going to remind everyone of a few things in regards to addressing to the school board. During the public comment part of each regular school board meeting, up to 30 minutes time will be allowed uh, to persons to address the school board, and each person may have up to five minutes to speak. This is a time of listening by the school board. The board will not take action or dis discuss topics brought forward during the open forum. And the board has the discretion to have the superintendent follow up with you as necessary, and the superintendent will follow up with the school board as necessary. 
and the chairperson or presenting officer will have full, full authority to terminate the remarks of any person of those remarks are considered deflam uh, defamatory, abusive, obscene, irrelevant, or an evasion of any person's private data rights, and no personal tax will be allowed. At this time, I know we have one um, um, speaker coming up, and I think that's Amanda Motz. Andrea. Andrea. Oh, Andrea, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm, I'm Amanda all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight you can be. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and Andrea, if you'd like to be at the ch seat, if sure. you're comfortable in standing at a podium or wherever you'd prefer. That'd be better. My heart's beating out of my <laughs> chest. I'm not That's a great right. public speaker. Um, school board. Uh, I, again, I'm Andrea Motes. I have two children in the Lonsdale or er, TCU school district. One goes to the high school and one goes to Lonsdale Elementary. Um, she's in fifth grade so we chose to keep her local in Lonsdale so she was a little closer. It's nice to have that flexibility. But um, I'm here tonight to address the school board about the existing bullying policy at TCU and in my case the slow response escalation um, and lack of knowledge of what to do when a student threatens the life of another student as well as the availability of the policy on the website and I guess uh, per the bullying policy there is to be a, a building report taker and in Lonsdale, uh, I'm to understand it's the principal who is to be responsible for receiving reports of bullying and or conduct and is to fill out the bullying form, complete an investigation, and report to the parents. Noted in uh, under definition, section C, immediately means as soon as possible, but no event longer than 24 hours. In our case, our daughter was threatened by a bullying student um, in her words, I'm going to light you on fire. And this is after uh, almost eight weeks of miscellaneous being mean and got to the point of bullying because I, I guess if a kid's told, knock it off, that's not nice, and then they continue to do that to me, uh, that's bullying. And um, she, uh, this girl moved to town. My daughter tried to be her friend, but um, the student decided to be mean, and not only to my daughter, but at least three other students in the fifth grade class um, that we're aware of. And this threat took place, you know, November 9th, and I got no phone call. I called the, ne the next uh, Monday morning to discuss, and the principal was had called in sick. However, she was told that I had left a message and she did call me back and said that she'd have to need to do an investigation per the policy and uh, she would communicate back to me. We waited another two, let's see, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, two more days and heard nothing. Um, so then we, I emailed the principal that evening and asked if there was an update and she did respond back that she apologized for the delay and noted that we're following up our bullying and harassment protocols and implementing consequences accordingly and an intensive behavioral modification plan will be implemented and would have a designated person with the student and that she was to stay away from our daughter um, but wouldn't state what it was which left us wondering you know my daughter didn't want us to go to school she thought this girl was going to light her on fire and there was just a lax in the response time and I feel just neglecting. We then found out um, that the girl was in school suspended. I think we'll have to be careful of sharing any other data privacy on the student for discipline, please. Thank you. If we can't note what's going on, how is anybody supposed to know or to hopefully make things better? That's the only reason why I'm here. I'm not trying to 
um, point to finger sign things. things. I'm simply noting it's just, and I get there, it's, it's a process mm -hmm. and people have to be notified and there's an investigation. In the meantime, my daughter is scared to go to school. She, other kids are, are talking as well that they were bullied and it's just a, a very slow response time. Uh, then I proceeded to check in with the superintendent and I asked if a police report was filed and uh, was told that she'd have to check with administration to which the next morning a police report was filed. But the principal wasn't aware of the need to file one. The policy states to make resources or referrals to resources available to targets or victims of bullying. And that is under report procedures under um, item 4D. And I don't feel that was done. I asked, I ended up having to ask Dr. Preisler if there was a counselor on site for students and was told, yes, there is. But nobody went to my daughter. There was no, there was no communication. It seems like there's a lack of communication within the school. Maybe this is the first time they've experienced uh, such a threat. Um, it's been five minutes. And lastly, that is equally important um, to note that if you can make the policy easier to find on the website. You, not all of us are, are knowing where stuff is filed under district. You look, you look under, I typed in bullying prohibition policy and the search engine found nothing. I didn't know I had to look under school board and then under school board policy. And lastly, it's equally important, uh, I want to know the need to um, possibly break down the bullying policy by school or group. Because we are moving to, to K through six, and then there's seventh and eighth grade, and then ninth through 12, to maybe um, split it out. Because in our day now, things are happening with kids that are younger, based on maybe what they're watching, what they're seeing, and all that, and that I think should be taken into account. Thank you. Thank you for Thank coming. You. Uh, members of the board, I know in uh, section three of this uh, request to address the board that the board does have the discretion um, to have me as the superintendent follow up and bring uh, pieces back. Um, I just to let you know that I have been in uh, uh, multiple con conversations and communications with um, Ms. Motts and hopefully I said that right. I call her Andrea, but um, with, with our parent <laughs> um, in multiple times. Um, I cannot, I will not share what those conversations have been out of a, a privacy respect there, but um, we'll continue to do so. We've also um, initiated some reviews um, within uh, with MSBA and any up updates as well as far as bullying policies and protocols for us to do a, a deeper analysis and review of that to solidify all processes and communications. All right, um, next we'll move on to uh, informational items. First up is our audit. Yeah, there's different presentations. Did you get it? Can I take more? Yeah. Would you like the mouse, Justin? Sure. <laughs> you have to run the show here and everything else, right? We have the song. Do I need to? It's okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'll say it. 
I'll say who I um, Superintendent Preissler, members of the board, again, I'm Jean Cup, Director of Business Services, and I'm here with Justin Fazzi from Clifton Larson Allen, who completed our fiscal year 18 audit. So he'll present the findings and read the results of, of that audit. Sure. Thank you, Jean. Yes, um, my name is Justin Fazzi. I'm a manager with Clifton Larson Allen. I've been uh, working in our uh, state and local government, working with schools, uh, working in this group for uh, just about seven years now, so I've been uh, working with school districts for a while, working with Tri-City United here the last uh, two fiscal years, so um, working with Jean since she came on, so uh, it's been a, a learning experience for both of us, so um, <laughs> thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, I'm here to present the, the audit results of the fiscal year 18 audit, um, and we'll run through a few slides, um, check, talk a little bit about your fund balance, some benchmarking slides, and then um, open it up for any questions or comments from you guys. Um, so I want to, of course, thank you for having me. Thank you for the, the continuing relationship between Tri-City and, um, and Clifton Larson Allen having the opportunity to serve the district. Um, thank you to Jean here and Brenda's over there helping out too. But thank you for them and their team in the, in the business office. Um, uh, an audit is a, a lot of work. It's not just the, the kind of the culmination here of the, the board presentation, but it uh, kind of expands over, over several months, a lot of hours. Um, and we tend to be a little needy when we're here, so we, we appreciate the, the help and the follow-up that we got. Um, uh, Terry, Jean, if you have anything to you know chime in as we're going through, feel free to feel free to um, comment on anything we're going through. Uh, with that, we'll kind of scroll through here and we'll go through the slides. But um, no, I should introduce here the the materials we handed out. Um, Kind of the, the little thinner packet, we'll say executive audit summary on there. That is kind of the, a little more of a condensed version. Um, towards the back it'll have uh, the slides that we'll be going over here tonight, so if you want to flip through and follow along with that. Um, in the front, there's a couple required communications that were required to present to the board. Um, just um, as part of our audit procedures. The thicker packet financial statements, some fun reading in there. Um, it's got the financial statements, uh, it's got the management discussion analysis, which is a required uh, piece of the financial statement process required to be completed by Gene, just kind of outlines um, some of the financial results of the district. Um, and our financial statements are note disclosures, which highlight, um, kind of highlight and provide some context for the for the financial statements themselves. Um, there's also some single audit reporting in there um, with the district uh, expending more than 750,000 in federal expenditures during the year. That triggers a single audit, so it's actually a uh, compliance-based audit. Uh, so for that, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit here too, but uh, we'll, we tested uh, child nutrition and Title I, that, or, or just child nutrition. Just child, just child, child nutrition this year. year. Um, so we'll do a semester of compliance-based auditing over those, so um, pulling some disbursements, checking some things, a um, lot of kind of um, dotting the C's, crossing the I's, a little more related to that as far as the compliance-based piece there. Um, so I won't deep dive into the, uh, the financial statement packet. Uh, you're welcome if you want to flip through and if any questions come on, um, we can certainly uh, discuss those. But for for kind of what we need to do here and what you guys are interested in, I won't I won't deep dive into that one too much. So, uh, moving to the slides here, our, our audit opinion. That's kind of the the main reason why we're here. The the big piece there. Um, we're issuing a clean audit opinion. Um, so, the financial statements, the note disclosures, everything in that packet uh, is materially stated in accordance with accounting principles. Internal control over financial reporting. Um, we have our our two pieces there. Uh, similar to last year, um, we have our um, one deficiency related to the financial reporting process, which is um, CLA uh, helps basically helps the district prepare the financial statements. Um, it's uh, <laughs> it's quite a undertaking. It's, uh, it takes us um, quite a few hours just to, for us to prepare these, and uh, we we do a number of them. So it'd be quite an undertaking for for Jean to kind of take that on herself. So. Um, Nothing new there. We had the same thing last year. Um, the other finding is um, 
some audit adjustments. Um, you know, Gene's second year in here. There's still some, still some learning going on and some things going on. And obviously, with uh, taking on the bond, bond proceeds and starting some construction, um, we had some adjustments that we proposed and we posted for those. Uh, compliance and other matters. So Yellow Book um, ties with um, audits of governmental entities. Um, so there is uh, certain procedures we perform uh, related to laws, regulations, contracts, grants. We know there are no issues with those. And then uh, the single audit there. The uniform guidance kind of highlights uh, the overview of what we're required to look at for a single audit. Um, so we, again, we tested the child nutrition cluster. Um, no to no findings, no issues there. Continuing with the audit summary here, we have our um, Minnesota legal compliance. There's a set of statutes uh, issued by the state that uh, school districts specifically are required to follow. So there's, um, I think, seven different areas that we have to review and look at. Um, again, a little more compliance-based um, with those. Uh, we had one issue, um, kind of a sucky one for you guys because you don't have a full control over it, but uh, related to collateral. So the um, the statute reads that the district, if you have deposits at uh, a single depository in, in excess of the FDIC coverage, uh, you're required to um, obtain collateral from the from the depository. So the bank has to kind of play its part in this too. Um, you're supposed to pledge collateral for 110 uh, percent of what's over the over the FDIC coverage. So um, our testing noted at the end of December we were under collateralized um, about 190,000. So there's that um, that window there where it's um, open to potential loss. Um, that's kind of how the statute reads. Uh, everything was corrected when we, we looked at June 30th as well. So everything was corrected by then. So um, kind of just a little a little hiccup. It's um, you know not always on the <laughs> not 100% on the district on that one. So but I have validated December balances <laughs> for this year. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna have that one again. <laughs> uh, the student activity funds. Um, so we kind of provide a, a separate little audit opinion related to the student activity funds, um, the not not under board control. Uh, we issue here what is a, a, a qualified audit opinion um, strictly related to it's a accounting basis other than um, generally accepted accounting principles. So it's a accounting basis uh, prescribed by MDE. Um, so it's kind of a little bit of a technicality, but this is um, the standard audit opinion that we give on all of our uh, student activity fund audits. Um, nothing new there. Uh, Minnesota legal compliance, um, again, kind of same with the district, how they have a set of statutes that they have to follow. Uh, there is a separate um, little subset for student activity funds. Uh, we had one, uh, one finding reported there was just um, student activity funds have to, every disbursement has to um, have the signatures of the uh, student representative and the uh, advisor, and then it has to have supporting documentation for the disbursement. Um, we just, in our test of 25 disbursements, we noted one that did not have supporting documentation. So a little more just a documentation issue there. It wasn't uh, that, the, that the disbursement was incorrect or wrong or um, inappropriate anyway. It was just uh, documentation. One thing we want to point out here, uh, for fiscal 18, we adopted GASB 75. <clears throat> which relates to uh, other post-employment benefits, uh, strictly the, the reporting of the other post-employment benefit liability. Um, so this will be um, related to um, basically the district providing health insurance for, uh, for a district employee that would retire until they reach the age of, of Medicare. So there's kind of that window there. Um, this is a actuary determined liability. Jean kind of touched on it in her truth and taxation presentation there too. Um, we obtain a valuation report from an actuary that calculates the liability based on a set of assumptions that they use. Um, so it's a little bit of a 
kind of take their word for it and based on their assumptions. So um, by no means does this mean that this is the amount that the district will strictly pr uh, pay out. Uh, doesn't mean you're going to change the way you budget or pay for it at all. It's um, strictly a um, more of an accounting entry that we get to do. So um, there's a couple points of emphasis in the uh, in the executive audit summary and in the financial statements. Um, we also point emphasis to it in our audit opinion. Uh, so there's a couple places there. So um, if you're flipping through uh, the financials, you can see that um, in our audit opinion letter on page three, um, it's also in a separate no disclosure in here on page 65 or else it's um, also included in the kind of the slim packet on page two. So this slide uh, highlights, this is general fund, so it kind of breaks out our revenues, expenditures, um, and breaks it out into which uh, the different buckets there, <coughs> different buckets here. So we have um, kind of on the left, uh, you have your unassigned, assigned, and non-spendable, so that's really what's available for the district to use. Um, and there's some non-capital restricted fund balances related to restrictions from MDE. Uh, and then you have some capital related restrictions there for operating capital, health and safety, and LTFM. <coughs> uh, one thing to note here with health and safety, uh, this one will be going away at the end of fiscal 19. Uh, this is uh, kind of phased in with the LTFM rollout uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so the, the negative amount there is just really a levy adjustment coming through. Um, so the negative about 70,000 of fund balance at the end of fiscal 19, that'll get rolled into your unassigned fund balance and get kind of absorbed in that way. Uh, next few slides, we'll kind of break down the uh, different fund balance buckets. We'll give some uh, historical trends here. So this uh, unassigned, assigned, and non-spendable, um, we're sitting about 7.9. As you can see, a, a pretty steady upward tick here of fund balance, um, building some fund balance in your assi unassigned. This will be strictly the unassigned portion. So that, that original slide, that 7.9, that included a, um, over 2 million of assigned fund balances. So we had um, assigned about 1.1 million for some facility improvements that you guys are planning on doing and then about 1.5 for your one-to-one -one technology initiative. So um, that's kind of the, the difference in this slide. So this is strictly um, unassigned fund balance and what hasn't been earmarked for future projects here. So 5.3 million. Uh, the, Restricted fund balances, uh, excluding capital related restrictions. So this will be your um, learning and development, ba basic skills are the big pieces here. A little bit of a, a spend down here um, related to those two. There's also some staff development, safe schools, medical assistance. Um, these are related to, um, some of those are tied to the students that generate the, the revenue there. They have to be restricted for, for their future use. Um, as long as different programs like the, the learning and development, staff development, certain um, required programs. Operating capital. So this will be uh, restricted for purchase of equipment and facilities uh, for future, uh, future district use, uh, about 725000 So, And I'll just add a comment here on, on this slide. This was some at the beginning of the year, we were setting our operating capital budgets of last year. Excuse me, we were un, it was unknown the event, the outcome of a bond um, referendum. So when we when that passed in February, um, we did some kind of hold back on some of the planned expenditures, knowing that we were going to have construction, FFNE, and just a lot of stuff happening in our next fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 20. So that would explain kind of the <coughs> hold the. This increase in fund balance really is, means that we didn't spend as much money as we had anticipated and we did, didn't do that on purpose because we wanted to hold off with some things um, with referendum and construction um, coming. So just some more context on those bars. <laughs> yes, not hoarding money, you're just no. uh, winning We're to spend it. Planning it out yes. longer, yes. 
So the slide kind of merges too. We touched on the, the LTFM funding rollout. This kind of merges the pieces together here. Um, the blue bars are health and safety. The red bars there, the, the old deferred maintenance um, revenue streams, and then the uh, LTFM there. Um, so when you kind of look at it as a blended component, you can kind of see how it all, all pieces together. Deferred maintenance dropped off last year. Um, health and safety is not funded anymore, but there's still some of those um, levy adjustments coming through. Um, that one will that one will drop off at, at the end of fiscal 19. So this is kind of the the trend of your fund balance related to that component. Uh, your food service fund balance here, um, we can see a we can see a drop here. This was really related to some plan spend down. Um, we, we did a lot of capital related purchasing, about 235,000 of capital. Uh, capital purchases there. Um, some of this was, you know, kind of directed by MDE. We were building a bit of a fund balance there. They have some restrictions on how much can be sitting in a food service fund balance. So um, nothing too new or surprising there. Uh, the main thing you always want with your, your food service and community service fund is really just for them to be self-sufficient. Um, and that's what we're getting there. Community service. Uh, we kind of had a bump there, so we increased our fund balance about 60 grand. Um, you know, again, just you want the program to uh, the program offerings to support themselves. So um, that's kind of the, the direction you guys are heading. Obviously, with um, some of the new um, referendum programs and things like that, you're hoping to expand and hopefully keep this keep this thing going. So, MD used to have some restrictions on community service fund balance. Um, if you increased your or if you had too much. Um, fund balance and community service, they actually uh, impose some restrictions, so those have been lifted, so you're, you're free to grow um, community services as best as you can. And your debt service fund balance. So the, the two columns on the left um, obviously <laughs> look, a little, look a little daunting there. Um, some of that's related to the, the 2013A bonds um, that were refunded. Um, so 16, 17, 18 are a little more normal. This will continue to um, some have some fluctuations here depending on um, what's your future debt service activity. Yep. So the two key items that are impacting our previous year, fiscal year 18 on this one, would be the inclusion of um, about $500,000 for the, 20, the Series 2018 A-bond. So that as I showed you in some of the other things I presented today, really set money really sits in fund six, our construction fund. Um, however, um, as I noted in my previous presentation, we aren't going to get taxpayer money to fund that levy until the spring of this coming year, and we owe it. Um, we owe on those debts coming in February. So part of what happened at the time that we got the, the, um, the money from the bond sale in June was that a portion of that was set aside to be able to pay our bills in February our, for our principal and our interest payments. So that money is sitting in here now, um, ready to be paid in February. Um, the other portion of it is we do have one bond that's different than our other bonds um, in the way that it's structured and we are essentially in a typical um, debt you would pay it off over time, you'd be paying a portion of your uh, principal and a portion would be interest of what you pay. Um, and this one is structured a little bit differently. It's resulting from the stimulus, so it's not a typical one, but we are essentially building up um, and we'll pay that one giant lump sum in the future. So this will continue to increase because of that. This balance will continue to increase because of that bond until um, it's paid off in the future. So those are the two components. That's about $500,000. So that's the, the two components I would note of why we have um, this increase this year. And that would have been a, you know, a driver of the increase last year as well, that bond. So. Jean kind of stole my thunder on this oh, slide already. Oh, sorry. But, you know, I checked my numbers while you were going through, and they, you know, they look good. So. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so That's we, what I'm here for. So 84, 80, yeah, 84, 85 percent stay funded. So, yeah. um, you know, that's that's really the big driver for the district. Um, state funding, um, state funding's main drivers on enrollment. So, um, really the big piece there. And our expenditures, but I broke it out a little differently. So oh, um, this is um, just a little bit by program code. This 
gets a little busy up here. Um, the one piece I would know, kind of the the orange, green, uh, the ones on the left, um, kind of wrapping around there. The, the instruction related um, components here is about 78% um, of the district expenditures are instruction related, are going or student related, I should say. So um, whether it's education, instructional support, or pupil support, so that's a that's a good. A uh, good percentage to have. Usually, we see anywhere from 75 to 80 percent. So you guys are you're right in the ballpark there, where um, the majority of your expenditures are going back to the student focus. Here's uh, the five-year trend here. Your enrollment numbers um, holding pretty steady here. We had a little a little slip from 17-18, but um, you know overall we're we're hanging in in there. The next uh, set of slides here is probably about the next eight slides. Um, these are uh, benchmarking <coughs> slides. So these uh, will show a five-year trend for Tri-State United um, in the blue. The orange column will be districts of similar size based on your enrollment. So it's the, the 1,000 to 2,000 enrollment range. And then the green bar over there uh, is the state average. So that just takes all the districts in the state and, and averages them out. Um, so we'll kind of move through these pretty quick, but um, they're they're available in your executive odds summary packet if you want ever want to go back and check how you guys are comparing to similar size districts or the state averages. But um, this one is uh, district and school administration. So this is um, all your admin and support related to that. Um, encouraging slide here when you're looking at. Um, where the district's stacking up to uh, the comparables there, um, spending less on admin and, and support than, than other districts. So that's always a good thing. Uh, regular instruction, you guys are right on par, um, hanging, hanging right around that $5,000 mark. Special education uh, coming in under, which is which is always a good thing. Um, special education is very volatile and, and pretty hard to predict. So um, if you're you're holding your expenditures pretty steady and, and keeping those in check. Uh, the instructional support uh, we had a little spike here. One thing to note: there was some um, changes from MDE as far as some of the coding related goes to some of the expenditures. So this will. Um, 18 might seem a little inflated, but that's um, a little more of a coding shift from um, from where some things were coded before to, to where they are now. Uh, your food service program here, um, obviously 18 looks a bit of a jump, but we knew that we were going to spend some more on expenditures there. So that one's a little, little higher just um, due to some of the capital outlay that we had in, in fiscal 18. And our community service, holding steady there, um, in line with your peers. And our debt service payments there. Um, this will this will start to rise a little bit as we bring on our our new debt that we took out in fiscal 18. So this um, that downward trend will shift and go the other way, but that's kind of the the point of taking on the new debt. So you got to pay for it. So. Um, those were the slides I had prepared for you, you know, kind of just summarizing this, summarizing this up. Um, you know, overall we had a, a good clean audit. Um, we had a, a couple findings, but um, nothing, you know, glaring. Um, we don't have anything, uh, big holes or anything to bring to your attention. Um, you know, Gene and her team do a very good job and very good to work with, so. Thank you. And I'll just say um, a big thanks to the entire district business office team, um, Brian Rozier and Kayla David and Maggie Grimm. Um, they do an enormous amount of work every day and also just for this audit, but uh, every day. And it's a very fun place to work and we get a lot done. And um, it's very effective. And um, they just feel really great about how we all work together and about the service to the district. So. Um, that shows through in the results here, but um, 
So that's exciting, exciting to have it validated. Um, but big thanks to them, and then also a big thanks to our audit team. Um, as Justin said, this was my second one. So um, it, it's always learning to go through and review what you've done for the past year, and I actually really welcome it and look forward to it. And it's, again, good validation. I trust our team, so there's not a big anxiety around it, because I know we're doing the right stuff every day. And if you do the right stuff every day, then you'll have a, a good outcome. Um, but it, it's, um, it is a big learning curve. So thank you to Justin and the team for um, helping me along here in my second audit. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any questions for us? You answered the questions that were in my brain that I was Oh, wow. Answer, so I appreciate that. Awesome. Good. <laughs> Good. Okay, so then um, later this will come forward to the board for your approval. Great. I do want to Thank just you. take a moment to echo Jean's words, though, on, uh, on the teamwork and everything at uh, Brenda, Kayla, and Maggie, and in our entire administrative and our entire staff. Um, audits come through by making sure that uh, uh, you're following purchasing and, and uh, reimbursable procedures, um, keeping track of your receipts, doing all of those things, making sure your time clock and pay is right, and uh, that takes a, an all-team effort um, by our whole staff. So really proud and pleased um, with the work that's done, and Jean's leadership has been just impeccable with our, within our district office and our district. So thank you, Jean. Thank you. Great. Thanks. All right, so we'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be back. <laughs> we'll be here. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. All right, we have our building project update. Mr. Keith Stockman. Good evening, Superintendent Preisler and school board members. I'm Keith Stockman. I'm with ATSNR, and I represent you and the architects and engineers during the construction phase of your building construction program. Tonight, I'm going to give you a quick update of what's going on and what we can expect to see in the next month. And we're going to start with the Lonsdale Elementary School. I think I left packets at everybody's desk. Okay. Um, the contractor is continuing to work on the load bearing CMU walls, load, the, the concrete block portion of the walls. Um, and by the, um, they, they actually fell behind a little bit because of the weather, but they've uh, increased their crew and, and, and uh, materials and labor on the site and have started to make up the, the, um, the lost time and we're expecting to have the load bearing walls completed by December 14th. Um, the bar joists and the metal deck and steel are on the job site, ready to be erected. They'll be erected. Um, so what we can expect to see starting uh, next week for the next month is the uh, erection of the steel joist and deck, um, and also the last exterior wall, which is the east wall, which is not load bearing. It closes off the, the east or the end of the building addition. And then after that roof deck and, and uh, joists are installed, then moving to a roofing installation so we can get the building dry. And we can start enclosing it and putting some heat to it. Um, the ground is frozen. Well, they put some blankets down, but the ground is probably frozen. It needs to be thawed out. And then we can look at putting a, uh, the concrete slab on gray down to start the work um, inside the building. The next project is, the, is a high school project. And as we talked about last time I met with you, we have three areas that we report on. Area A is the auditorium. Area B is the ag and PLTW lab. And then the area C is a science lab. In area A, the auditorium, they are con they've completed the earth and soil correction work in that area. Um, they're currently working on the footing of foundations. Uh, they started along the south side of the building. My walk through today, they, have, uh, they are forming the foundation walls for the west wall, which is along the drive, the long wall, the, the stage side of the auditorium, the um, yes, stage side. And they're also working along the, um, the gym area along the uh, uh, east side. And um, they'll continue to work on that for the next several weeks. Uh, they're also doing a little bit of CMU um, foundation walls over by the green room and um, 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 mine with blank um, scene shop area, which is uh, uh, masonry construction in that area. 
work for the next month, they'll continue with the foundations. And just a side note, that the erection of the precast wall panels is expected around January 21st. That'll be an exciting time, because those are good size panels, and there'll be a big crane sitting on your site. Okay, moving on to area B, the Mag and um, Ag Shop and the PLTWs. The filling and foundation work is completed. They're just wrapping up the backfilling of those foundation walls. Later this week, uh, Wells Precast, who is supplying the precast panels for that um, egg, um, um, wood, or the middle of an egg shop, will be on the job site doing some layout um, and drilling in anchors into the ground for um, bracing of the precast panels because on Monday the 17th, the precast panels for the egg shop will be erected. So it'll be Monday and Tuesday of next week. So we'll get to see what our, our that new uh, precast construction will look like. But we'll be out of the ground in area B. Um, in area C, um, they are continuing with the footings. Well, the footings are completed. They're working on the underground foundations, the CMU foundations and they'll continue to do so. Once they get completed with the foundation walls, they'll start uh, scaffolding and enclosing um, above grade and start building the exterior CMU walls and face brick. Um, we had understood that the steel uh, deck would be arriving soon and the, and the bar joists for areas B and C were on order and we found out today that the, the steel joists will not be on the job site until about the middle of January. So I'll delay putting a, a, the roof on top of this, uh, the two areas of B and C. Um, I don't think that has a, a negative impact on the schedule as we see it right now. So that's the update for the progress, the construction progress. The last time I have to deal with on the high school is we do have a change order issued to bring to the board for review. It's, it's a, um, what we had discovered during the excavation for areas B and C was some ex unacceptable uh, existing soil conditions that were required to be removed and be replaced with imported compacted engineering fill. Uh, we had subsurface explorations or soil borings performed before the start of the project design to, to uh, try to anticipate what the soil capacities of those soils would be and the unsuitable soils, unacceptable soils were not found in those soil borings. We missed those spots with our soil borings. Um, as part of our bidding for the project, we included a unit price for just this situation if it occurred. Um, so we had a, cu a cubic yard price for removing the unsuitable soils from the job site, importing in, um, engineered fill and compacting it. So based on that unit price is what, how we used to calculate the, the additional cost for the project. The special inspections and, and testing services that uh, you had uh, hired for your, um, that type of services had monitored and documented the additional work. Um, the earthwork contractor also provided, and I attached that with the, your board packet this evening, their computer generated model comparing the original scope of work and the additional work provided. And it kind of reveals to you what we, what we encountered as far as, um, in, in, if you look at that last page, I mean, the red areas are the areas of the project where we had to dig down much deeper than what we anticipated. Soil borings indicated we'd probably be digging down anywhere from between one and, and two feet for unsuitable soils. Um, we found at the end of the metal shop um, was some unsuitable soils. There is a trench um, from that yard catch basin that's going to be in your courtyard coming out through area B. Uh, was had some unsuitable soils around it. Then we found a large pack, pocket of area in area C. And, and like I said, we missed none of the soil borings that landed in these areas. So it's like we tried. <laughs> Um, okay. So the, the, the contractor submitted its proposal, and this is a proposal that is based on after work was completed. It was not one where we could do an estimate of work and, and give a prior approval to this. It was based on actual quantities, time and material for removing the material and, and the product coming in, calculated on the square uh, cubic yards of material submitted or used to do that work and their cost came in at a cost at $85,899. Um, at the end of the, at the bottom of that same page, I've given you some photographs that are not very clear, but it gives you an idea of just how large holes we had to dig to remove to get down to suitable soils. Soils have to be suitable to provide bearing for the, the foundation and the slab. If not, 
then you could experience some uh, failure, some cracking in the building. So that's the engineer. The soils are investigated before we design to determine its bearing capacity, and based our structural designs on that. Uh, when you run into soils that are not com uh, not going to uh, be able to bear that capacity of weight, uh, they have to be removed and replaced with new material. It comes down to that. It's an unforeseen problem, um, not one that we. Um, it created some panic when it first came out, and we were told about it. So, I'd rather find out with the dirt than find out after the fact that the buildings are up and we have to make changes <laughs> because the oak buildings are sinking. So. Well, and we took a lot of precautions so that that wouldn't happen. Okay. okay. <coughs> so we, we investigated beforehand. We have somebody monitor them as they are doing the work. Um, you know, it's it's it's. You found it. We found it. Yeah. ATS and I recommends the owner accept the change in the scope of work and the contract proposal for the change. So, um, is this a motion for later or? Yeah, yeah. we okay. have it as a motion in the okay. action item. So thanks, Keith. And then the last item is Montgomery Elementary School, um, which I have no really no update for you this evening. I think we met last week to review the bids and the the award of the contract. We were hoping to get a pre-construction conference going by now, but we're both the Metcon, who is on the high school project side, and and myself is I mean, kind of buried in some paperwork. Uh, trying to keep the high school up and running as fast as we can, uh, but we will do so in the next month um, to get that project um, kicked off and, and and get the paperwork going. I have a question on the boring of the soil and testing. So, uh, you know, it was missed, but does the person or the, the person we use, do they ever guarantee those testings? Because if you do it and it's missed, then what was the because now we're going back and catching this. And I'm, I'm happy that we're catching it, but we paid to have it tested and it was not caught. Just tell me, is that like standard for this to Let's happen? go back and review that process a little bit. Again, before yeah. we start our design, um, and we have a, a, an idea of what the building footprint's gonna be, we um, solicit on your behalf um, a company to do the soil investigation. Mm -hmm. um, we have an outline of the building and um, we locate where we want to have soil borings taken, okay? And they're usually around the perimeter of the building where the foundations are at. We had five on, this pro on that area of the building um, board and the boring did not, they, they did not occur where the bad soils had occurred. These are pockets of areas. They're not the entire area of the, of the building. Um, they look like there are some in trenches, backfilling of trenches of utilities from the past projects that some unsuitable soils will probably just use to backfill those at a late, you know, to, instead of using the good soils that you may or may not have on your project site. So it looks like you might have some bad soils uh, in and around this area. So we locate where we want to have the soil testing done. The soil testing was done and there's no guarantee there because they're just telling us what the evaluation of materials in what layers and what thicknesses and capacities are. So, but we, the soil borings did not occur where these pockets of bad material were. Uh, were found. That clear? It's just isn't my area, so I'm curious oh, I to know. <laughs> Sometimes I go fast through this, and I think you know. Well, I'm, no, I, I really think, like you know. You know, we're spending money on these things, and so I just want to better understand it. Sure. For the point of why it was done, and then now we're coming back. It's a big chunk of money too. It's it. a big chunk of money, and yeah. again, we're trying to find those unsuitable soils when we start. So we didn't uh, didn't drill in the right place, I guess. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Next month will be, I mean, we'll start seeing some buildings going up. So we'll have some, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna go faster now. We're gonna have more to report to you and um, it's gonna be a good time. If that's it, then did, I take, did I go fast enough? You did good. Okay, do I have to stay for years now? <laughs> no, you don't. Okay, go. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Keith. Thanks, Keith. All right, next we have our workforce uh, development coordinator position. Yes, uh, this position came about uh, through the Greater Pathways to Success grant, which started with the um, Greater Twin Cities United Way um, grant for our, our region. And we were fortunate to be able to have been one of the districts as a part of that grant, because not everybody is. Um, and so through the work uh, through this grant and exploring pathways and some of the ways to really strengthen and bolster uh, partnerships with uh, local employers is that uh, 
some larger districts, say like Mankato or, or larger districts of uh, Hutchinson or Burnsville have a workforce development coordinator. And what that position basically is, is that liaison with your employers in your school district. It becomes that, that clear communication, not only about the partnerships that could come, but also about then bringing those ideas of partnerships to the employers, bringing those back to our school, working with our staff on um, what types of opportunities, be it job shadowing, internships, even adopt a classroom, uh, types of models to be able to strengthen and create more authentic career experiences for our students uh, to help them find out where their interests and aptitudes might be and find out where they're not. Um, and so uh, approached uh, St. Peter and Lesur Henderson uh, last year on you know, what might it look like for us to have a shared position on this, knowing that um, each of our districts would, you know, for us to have one alone would be very difficult. And we brought that forward to the GPS grant um, executive board, and they were 100% in favor of it and providing funding for the remainder of this school year and all of next school year for us to hire a workforce development coordinator. Uh, posted the position, we had a good solid uh, candidate pool and have emerged with an offering of the position to Carrie Odlin. Uh, Carrie is uh, currently an administrative assistant in one of the schools in um, St. Peter, but her experience has been extensive within career counselor, career development specialists at uh, both four-year universities and also two-year community colleges, which really gives that great connection of all options and any type of post-secondary um, learning is so important. And so, um, Carrie uh, has accepted the position. Uh, she will start January 3rd, and between now and then we'll be developing uh, some plans for the shared position, days of the week that she'd be in various communities, those types of things. And uh, she, her office for here at Tri-City United would be housed here at the high school, so she has closer interaction with our um, counselors, with our career tech ed teachers, and uh, being able to also communicate opportunities to students. So. Yeah, we're pleased to have Carrie on board, and we'll have a lot to learn in this process as well, since this is a position we've not had before, um, but can bring those partnerships to a whole nother level, and um, excited to see what Carrie can bring. So the question that I would have with the three uh, school districts, uh, Sora Henderson being the smaller, uh, Tri-City United and St. Peter, Will they look at a, a percentage of her time <clears throat> then equal to enrollment in those school districts? Has that been discussed? You know, um, we haven't done it as a percentage of the districts. And really, one of the pieces that we're finding, or that we've talked about, though, is to consider she's serving three school districts, but really then also serving our three communities, the two communities within Lesur Henderson, St. Peter's communities, and looking at this as regional employers rather than just partnerships um, siloed within the, the communities <coughs> and the school district. So it might uh, lead itself to a partnership with uh, uh, um, job shadowing and internships with students from Tri-City United with an employer in St. Peter and vice versa. St. Peter students here in one of our communities. So uh, we haven't laid that out as a percentage. Um, I think part of that comes because it is fully funded through the grant rather than from our, our local um, fun general funds. Uh, if in fact we were at down the road to consider funding this position within uh, school district funds, I think that would be a very important thing to do. Um, right now it's, it's about a, a regional partnership. Great question. Does she have a, or will there be a home base or is it in each one of the schools, she'll, she'll have a home base. So obviously three school district, five days a week, but you know some rotations and those types of things. And I don't know that this is going to be one we can cookie cut or slice real sure. nice and clean like that. Um, so we, there, we have learned a lot since the idea came about, but I'm so glad we didn't wait for it to be perfect before we did it. <laughs> this is one of those chances we have an opportunity. Let's take it and go and see how far it can go. So. When will that grant have to be rewritten again? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing with um, the Greater Twin Cities United Way is they kind of choose areas and uh, focuses, and so it's not necessarily um, an ongoing where we can keep applying and get it uh, re-upped. Now, interestingly, they did provide a grant for southwestern Minnesota, 
Um, the year before they did South Central Minnesota. And so I don't know if they're going to kind of piecemeal their way across the state of Minnesota um, or other pieces will come. But, uh, um, you know, there are other dollars like Perkins dollars, some things that are more local that could be helpful for it too. <coughs> it has, it has, we've learned a lot and it's really um, exciting work for career pathways for our kids. Any more questions? All right, we'll do a uh, December work session. This is just a reminder to um, our board and our community that we will not be having a work session in December, as I believe that would be Christmas Eve. Yes. Is it? <laughs> um, and when we set our uh, meeting calendar back in January at the organizational meeting, that meeting was not on that schedule. So this does not take board action to, uh, to not have that. All right, next uh, enrollment update. Within our monthly enrollments, um, we see a fairly steadiness going across, uh, little ups and, and some downs, but really for the most part, holding fairly steady. And at a bottom line, um, we're at 1851. As I take a look at this compared to a year ago, um, it puts us right at where we were a year ago, ahead of where we were the year before. and. Uh, Definitely like 110 students um, higher from where we were when we first started as Tri-City United. Okay. Uh, committee updates. Southwest Metro. Well, you have a uh, packet in front of you that um, I was showing uh, Superintendent Preissler uh, that we received at the uh, last Southwest Metro. Uh, the first page um, is uh, something that um, actually was initiated by Superintendent Chrysler in discussion uh, with these schools that you see here. Uh, they are looking uh, for uh, assistance uh, in their uh, special ed needs that they have. Uh, <clears throat> very, very frankly, uh, if you look at Shakopee, and then you start to look at these schools, yes, they're a great distance away, but the reason that they're looking at is, uh, uh, help me out, Superintendent Price, but it's Northfield, Faribault, Owatonna, Albert Lee, that are in a co-op together. They, they ended up um, where Albert Lee and Owatonna backed out, oh. and so it is now just Northfield and, uh, and Faribault, and Northfield is the uh, primary host. And so, um, very frankly, the biggest reason that they didn't go in that direction was their cost. Uh, that group of people were asking uh, per school of about a hundred thousand plus dollars for thus four hundred thousand uh, for those schools. Uh, uh, they look at what uh, Southwest Metro can provide for them. Uh, they feel that uh, this is the better way uh, for us to go. Very frankly, it is just an introduction. It is no decisions have been made yet. Um, even Superintendent uh, Pricer and I, uh, at our uh, Southwest Metro board, uh, board meeting, Darren told us that all uh, four of these, our, our membership now is 11, it would jump to 15. Superintendent Pricer said in her discussion with superintendents, they felt they were coming together as one entity and have one vote. But Darren was saying the room that we meet in could get crowded because of four more people. I mean, and, and so that those are the type of things. But this is something uh, that we are looking at. Another still possible membership, uh, uh, they have to go through an uh, applying and they have as of uh, our uh, December meeting had not applied. Uh, Minnetonka is another school district that is still very interested in enjoying Southwest Metro. So, the next pages are the. Can I uh, add one piece? To oh, that yes, now, yes, please? sure. Thank of you. Course, of course. One of the the values in having some other districts to the south and in our area that could be a value for Tri City United is it would allow us to some possible opportunities in partnering for um, transportation of our students so that in fact say if we have um, one student and they have one or two students now we can do a combined effort rather than three separate 
vans um, heading to the same place. The other piece that it brings forward is some possible, um, if there is a facili or facility needs or expansions that need to occur through in Southwest Metro due to numbers of students, now it be becomes a little more of a viability to look at locations down in our area versus everything to the north. And um, that could be a really huge cost savings for us as well. And then also, um, the, the, these districts do not have an 18 to 21 year old transition program. We also do not at this point. We have our students either attending Southwest Metro or um, working with Belle Plaine within their programming. And to be able to have some additional districts in our area for us to be able to bring that program back in house could be again significant savings even though starting a program is spendy but it would be really valuable as well. So it just gets a little something more geographically uh, valuable for Tri-City United to not be the southernmost district of the whole co-op or intermediate district, sorry. And each district has to give them yes or no vote, Correct. right? Is that how that right. goes? Yep. Okay. So uh, like Darren said to us, if it stays, uh, you know, we're gonna go from a, a 1 11th to a 1 15th. <laughs> so, <clears throat> We'll see. Uh, the next pages are the uh, legislative proposals that have come out of the Southwest Metro uh, District slash MSBA. Uh, and these are the legislative proposals that they uh, you know, are looking at. Uh, they're not asking us to look at these individually and uh, say yay or no, uh, nay. They're just having us uh, look at these. These are uh, what out there. A couple of them I would like to um, uh, point out the emergency drill uh, as we know that is fire drills with all of the unfortunate things that have been happening in our schools uh, uh, and this one actually comes out of Jordan uh, the changing of how you do fire drill procedures uh, having teachers staff administration you know observe before uh, immediately <coughs> and, and I always think it's a interesting term quitting the building that means you're leaving the building but they call it quit so <laughs> quit the building but I mean I think that's uh, uh, something that uh, uh, it was uh, presented last year and it failed and uh, they do feel that they have support for it this year um, the uh, uh, next one uh, superintendent and I have uh, Chrysler and I have discussed this one board mi uh, minutes the idea of uh, just putting the board mem uh, minutes on your website. Um, we both question that. We really feel that it's important that we use our local newspapers. Uh, many, many people still out there who don't have the internet. Uh, it's a, a better way of transparency. <clears throat> the next one um, is also a kind of an interesting pregnant, uh, pregnant teen uh, transportation. Uh, this happened to, happened to our neighbors to the north, New Prague. Um, they, uh, there is a program within the Southwest Metro called New Beginnings and it is for um, uh, teenagers who uh, are expecting a, a new child or have a new child and uh, are getting uh, help in those areas. Uh, what happened to New Prague is they had a student who was going to one of the schools uh, in uh, the Shakopee area but they put a, a student on there who was not a special needs person it, they really got uh, dinged by the State Department transporting you know that that was and it's just a common sense uh, uh, type situation there um, the other one uh, uh, once again uh, the ward of the state that one comes out of um, uh, Jordan what happened to Jordan was there was a student uh, who came to them uh, uh, with lots of uh, uh, concerns, special needs, uh, was in their uh, program for one week and uh, they could not provide the services that they needed and <coughs> Superintendent Price, and I can't remember, he either, either was then uh, transferred into Iowa and or Missouri, one of those two states, but because Jordan was the last school, the state said, you will fund, you will pay for that. And you know this is just once again some common state uh, legislation. No, they should be truly come water the states, and the state should be paying for that. 
The equitable funding, uh, that's the one uh, uh, that's been out there for quite some time, uh, making sure that we are providing enough funds in both our regular ed and our special education. Um, in, uh, that. Uh, and then uh, innovative mental health, just getting more um, uh, money available uh, to bring our specialists into our school systems. Um, other than that, uh, the last one that, that we included uh, is uh, the Southwest Metro uh, calendar. Does it really affect TCU? Yes, in a way, in the fact that uh, that's where we're you know, getting our, uh, at this particular time, uh, our law enforcement class that is being taught, uh, and that person comes uh, from there. And <clears throat> uh, this calendar, uh, as was clearly stated, is really determined by two school districts, Shakopee and Eastern Carver County. And uh, they can't get together and, and come up with a universal one, and so it ends up uh, unfortunately being one, but it somewhat affects uh, uh, us as well. And it's just the two different proposals that we have there. Um, other than that, um, I don't think there was uh, anything uh, the um, the gala that is, was held October 5th, uh, raised $26,000. Um, other than that, it was pretty, um, uh, there were some donations that were given uh, to uh, their, uh, their, to the Southwest Metro. But these items were probably the biggest ones that will be coming across our uh, tables again as we move forward throughout the year. Thanks, Dan. Yep. teachers are meeting at least one of their two goals. So all of our teachers put together their goals for the year and currently at least 92% of the teachers are meeting at least one of their two goals. These so are the goals <coughs> that Matt Flugum was talking about, like that kind of work? <coughs> Excuse me. planning going on. Um, January, we've got the staff plan, all staff planning day and um, second day, or actually it's opposite, uh, 14th will be spent more on grading and collaborative time, school safety type things. The second one is going to be geared more towards with the all day staff planning, correct? Did I get that right? Yes, the 21st is, is the all staff day for the full day, including paraprofessionals, clerical, custodians, IT, everybody. And they're split up this year, two different Mondays rather than back to back. Sure. Let's just kind of update what we've done at QCOM. Does anyone have any questions? I think you answered my question. Awesome, for now. That's really what we talk mostly about is the, the professional development that the teachers are doing and and how we're supporting them and how we can do better. And our finance committee, you heard it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we talked about. Gene, <laughs> do you wanna, do we miss out? Should I, I think we're good. Anybody else meet that isn't on the list? No, no. All right. We're going now to honor our outgoing board member. Well, Dan, would you come on up for a moment, please? What's that? You need to go to stand up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's my first time. Yeah, yeah. First class. First class. Well, Dan um, did a little. Uh, thinking about our school board members as a whole. And uh, it's important for everyone to realize that school board members are just ordinary citizens. They're your friends and your neighbors, and yet they have an extraordinary dedication to our community and to our children. They provide a vital service in our community, 
and public education is the backbone of American society and local school boards are deeply rooted in that U.S. tradition. The job of a school board member is tough and the hours are long and the thanks are sometimes far and few, be few and far between. And too often we forget about the personal sacrifices that school, boards member, school board members make to serve. So in these uh, times, they, diff they face difficult choices and shoulder critical responsibilities. And their ultimate goal is always focused on the future success of the children in our district. We applaud your willingness to serve as advocates for our children, the voice of public education, and is deeply committed to representing our Tri-City United residents. On behalf of our entire board and our school district, Dan, I want to thank you for your service, your passion, and your ongoing commitment to our Tri-City United students and residents. And as just a little symbol of our appreciation, can't be having a little bell to come home to dinner. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Come back sometime. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, it's been great. You know, serving with, with Dean Fine and Kevin, and Kevin, and also before when I first started with uh, uh, Amy and Deb Stuckman. So, um, it's been a fantastic time. Anybody in the community, I'd highly get involved with it. You learn a ton, a lot of moving parts in the school district. So, um, especially thank you. You've been a great mentor, not only for the school board, but also a professional. Level. So, thank you very much for all that. Time. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Danny. All right. Well, next, we're going to move on to new business. The first up was going to be to certify the final 18 payable 19 levy. Hello, everyone. I'm Jean Kapp, Director of Business Services. I am Rick, or Dr. Preisler, members of the board. Um, I'm requesting board approval of the 18 pay levy in the amount of $6,549,451.59. Um, the 18 payable 19 levy amount is an increase of 19.38% from the prior year's levy. The large increase is um, almost fully attributed to the series 2018A bond, which resulted from the passage of the two question voter referendum in February 2018. Um, after reviewing estimated tax statements, we have confirmed that communication of tax impact prior to the referendum vote are accurate. We also saw growth in our tax base due to an increased number of properties, um, population growth, and an increase in assessed property value. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, but ask if you have any questions regarding the levy um, or the certification process. So this is this is the continuation of the levy work that starts in July. We um, you provided with max maximum um, levy authority in September, and then this is the piece to, to certify the final portion. And we'll submit that to MD and our counties, and this is what they'll use to know how to assess our our property owners. Questions. All right, whereas pursuant to Minnesota statute, the school board of Tri-City United School District, Montgomery, Minnesota, is authorized to make the following proposed tax levies for general purposes. Maintenance, which is also known as the general fund, $2,146,775.76. Community service, $147,000, sorry, $147,597.70. Debt service, $4,255,078.13. The total proposed school tax levy of $6,549,451.59. Now therefore, be it resolved by the School Board of Tri-City United School District, Montgomery, Minnesota, that the levy to be levied in 2018 to be collected in 2019 is set at $6,549,451.59. All right, I'll need a second on that. One second. 
All right, on the resolution, uh, Danny rec recognized it and Krista seconded it, and this will be a roll call vote. Krista? Yes. Dale? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Dan? Yes. And Marcia is also yes. Roll call vote. Friends all passed. Yay, resolution passed. Um, next, yes. we'll move on to our FY18 audit. All right. Again, Jean Cap, Director of Business Services for Tri City United. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm requesting board approval for the fiscal year 18 audit with an affirmation of the sound fiscal responsibility TCU has demonstrated over the past years. The audit of the 1718 fiscal year was completed by the firm Clifton Larson Allen LLP. CLA has affirmed that the district's financial statements are fairly stated and issued a clean audit report, which is the best opinion. Um, there were two deficiencies noted in, in the internal control over financial reporting results, um, auditor preparation of the district's financial statements. This is no change from prior year. The district relies on our audit firm to prepare financial statements due to the specialized nature of the work and in consideration of the district's staffing resources. I'd also comment this is a fairly standard finding across all school districts, um, or most school districts, I shouldn't say all. Um, the second was the auditor recommendation of journal entries. Um, this again was one that happened last year as well. Um, these recommended journal entries are posted by myself as the director of business services. In the case of specialized or annual entries, I rely on the audit team's expertise and guidance, guidance in preparation and review of several journal entries. Um, there were no compliance issues noted in review of laws, regulations, contracts, or grants. There were no findings noted um, relating to compliance and internal controls over compliance on the single audit of the child nutrition cluster program. Um, there was one legal compliance finding that was noted. This was finding related to the level of our collateral for deposits. As Justin stated, we are required to have 110%. Um, I think we dipped, they, if I calculate it down to like about 106% um, at the time of December. I have affirmed where we stand for this year um, to uh, learn from that and make sure we're in a good spot um, for a for security of the district's funds. Um, the student activity fund, the CLA issued a qualified opinion. That's no change from prior years. And as, an, as Justin stated, it's an expected for audits of student activity fund. Um, one legal compliance was noted, um, resulting from a missing receipt for payment. Um, so again, this is just a culmination of, of really work that we do all year round. And Terry noted the number of Basically everybody, it takes everybody on our staff to make sure that we are doing things the way that we have to. Um, and the business office is, is like are the gatekeepers really of, of all of these things. And um, so June to August was field work or prep, field prep. And then September was the audit, field work. Um, October, November we do the follow up and then in December here we get our report out and then um, request board approval of the results and then we'll start all over again. <laughs> um, here's probably already starting in January looking over our internal controls and we just get on the merry-go-round again. So, um, but we're, we're proud to have a clean audit. Like he said it is a lot of work um, just in general and then also just to support these things. So um, we're proud of our team for that. So thank you. I'll seek a motion to approve the FY18 audit. I'll make a motion. Second. I have a motion by Ashley Re Receivo, second by Michelle Borgett to approve the FY18 audit. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion has passed 6 0. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll seek um, a motion to approve the change order for the TCI High School soil. Members of the school board, this is the, the action item that uh, Mr. Stockton brought forward um, as he ex um, gave ex explanation that really could not be um, determined ahead of time. It was uh, after everything was found, the cost came. This amount, change order amount is over the $50,000 threshold that the board um, uh, made a motion back in May for superintendent authority. Thus, we are bringing it forward even though it is after the fact. Um, simply due to the timing and needing to keep the project moving along. I'll make a motion. Uh, Michelle made a motion. I'll second it. <laughs> We're so efficient now. <laughs> motion by Michelle Borchard, second by Krista Gettle to approve the change order for the TCU High School soil in the amount of $86,000. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion is passed 6-0. Um, 
Next, we are going to discuss from the motion that we did make back um, back in May with a threshold of fifty thousand dollars, and see if we would like to amend that motion. Yes, members of the board. You know, now that uh, we have been underway within the uh, um, building projects, and certainly the situation here with the soils was one that we hope we do not experience again. And yet, we're going to be coming upon, um, you know, within the renovations is oftentimes when you find the unexpected. Uh, when you're digging into HVAC systems, when you're uh, opening up ceilings, when you're tearing down walls, uh, unexpected things may occur. And so um, recognizing that the last uh, motion was simply giving superintendent, the superintendent um, authorization to approve building project change orders up to 50,000 um, without bringing it to the board for approval. There was no other statement there about um, allowing that if in fact it's a situation like these soils that it would allow that to still move forward. And I do want to hold uh, um, true to what the motion is and so I'm, we're bringing this, um, this topic back for you to uh, consider if you're either wanting to leave it as is, recognizing we may have a situation like we had, or making an amendment to um, allow the authority to uh, move it forward um, if it's a situation that uh, causes the building project to be halted um, uh, but yet then still bringing it to the board for information and that after the fact or if you are um, uh, wanting to or interest uh, willing to increase the amount uh, to a higher threshold but uh, I will work within any of the motions or um, uh, directives of the board just wanted to bring this back now that we've actually experienced a situation <laughs> that did um, did run into that $50,000 threshold. So completely up to where the board wants to go. I would say that we'd want to add, you know, the, unless the change order yep. is necessary to keep the billing, no matter what direction we go, because, I mean, if we had a wait that would have delayed the project mm -hmm. two weeks, you know, we can't afford that. Um, I guess no matter how high you rate the threshold, it could always be the issue. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the biggest reason why we wanted the 50000 was to be transparent for, mm -hmm. you know, to making sure that we get there. Um, so I guess, I, I really don't care what direction we go, but I think that line, well, making sure the job stays on mm -hmm. the critical path is, is so I guess that's my two cents. Oh, I agree. I do too. I do too. And I think and, um, the other thing that, you know, needs to be noted and, and understood you know, the 86000 is not an additional cost. It's, it comes out of that contingency fund. It's not that we're adding, you know, the $22 million, whatever that was, in 86000 No, okay. it's within, you know, we're not ever going to go over that $22 million. And I just, I agree. I think uh, we just need to give the latitude of the progress of this mm -hmm. project moving forward at all times. So do we make a new motion or can we just amend what's the best way to do it just by adding that little bit onto the original motion, just make a new motion? Um, if, you're, if you want to leave the threshold at 50000 I think it would be making an amendment mm -hmm. to that motion or, or a new one. It doesn't, it, the, the most the recent same. would supersede the, right. the one from the past. So you have, um, you have leeway to do what you would like to do with the, with a motion or an amendment to the motion made in May. Yeah, that's what that first part. Right, but to keep it clean, and so we're referring back to the, rather than saying amendment, just to make the whole motion all over again, it keeps it clean. Okay. We, we want to leave it at the 50,000? Yeah, I think so, that. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. And then we'll just add on. Um, Unless the chain Yeah. Yes, that, that portion of it to the end of the motion that's already up there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, who wants to make that motion? I'll make the motion. I'll second that. All right, motion by Dan Rudd, second by Michelle Borchert to grant the Tricer United Superintendent the authorization to approve all, uh, all building project change orders up to 50000 um, without bringing it to the, for the school board approval unless the change order is necessary for keeping the building project moving forward, but still bringing the change order information to the board as an informational item. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion is passed 6-0. Thank you. We, we know we have two jobs to do with that building project. Get it done on time, get it done in budget. And that's what we will, we will do. <laughs> All right, now we're up to the T-Mobile and Empowered Ed Grant. 
Members of the board um, a few months ago became aware of this T-Mobile program or Empower Ed um, grant that uh, uh, is meant to provide uh, hotspots or internet to students in areas of our district that may be um, having difficult times accessing the internet due to broadband issues or possibly due to socioeconomic issues. And so we did apply for this grant and uh, did find out that we were awarded the grant. I am bringing this forward to you as the board for board action to accept the grant. Um, after uh, reviewing um, uh, some surveys with our students, uh, we've determined that we would be doing this grant for 50 hotspots, or 50 lines as it's called. <laughs> And it does recognize four schools, but one of the criteria within the grant is that students must be allowed and able to take that device home. Um, and so in our situation right now, it is our seven through 11 who have the one-to-one uh, um, -one in being able to take it home. So that would be where we would focus our, uh, our numbers of hotspots to be um, provided to students. The, uh, the grant would uh, provide $6,400 from T-Mobile for us to be able to utilize to purchase um, continuing or life cycle replacement um, Chromebooks or devices to help out then our capital costs for the future at least for a little bit. But there is then um, a reduced price per hotspot of $10 per line per month. So with 50 um, hotspots at $10 a month um, and then times 10 months, because we would shut them down for July and August or June and July, whichever two of the months in the summer we'd want to do, would cost us approximately $5,000 a year in order to provide this for our students. This is just another step though of um, equity and access for all students and uh, being able to um, impact student achievement so that students are able to access the necessary resources in order to be uh, growing and learning each day. motion or do you have a motion? Sorry. at our work session in November the question was asked <clears throat> is it one per family or if there was a freshman senior type seventh grade or senior mm -hmm. would it take two devices in that family was that were you able to find that answer yes it would be able to take two devices as long as it is our device that we are able to um, that we are able to program the hotspot for. So someone who would have their own device at home, they would not be able to utilize this hotspot for their own personal devices. It does need to be a part of our empowering learners one-to-one -one, um, device program. Super, thank you. Which makes sense. And it does limit it to like two gigs. So this is not like unlimited and <laughs> that kind of thing. Watching and it would run through our um, internet security systems. So our um, protection and everything through our, our e-rates and our internets would be covered so that again it does not allow students to be able to access um, sites that would um, not fit our internet acceptable use policy. And it would also allow us to move forward our e-learning days as well. Yes it would. All right, Krista made I'll a motion. Make a motion. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> motion by Krista Gettle, second by Dale Bus to approve the T-Mobile and Empowered Ed grant. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Motion is passed, 6-0. Uh, now we have our community update to pay. Uh, with the upcoming change of uh, minimum wage laws, uh, we are needing to bring forward um, an adjustment to our community ed rates of pay, in particular those being driven by those, um, our lifeguard, our summer rec student staff, and our other student workers. So increasing that hourly pay to $9.86 in alignment with minimum wage laws. And then I do believe, Lane, that you and Maggie worked through that other positions did see a slight increase in relation. Yeah, some of them did, yep. Some okay. of them did not. Okay. But otherwise, um, this is holding pretty steady to what had been previously approved. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. I have a motion by Dan Rudd, second by Ashley Receivable to approve the updated community education rates of pay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion has passed 6 0. Next will be the um, sub and temporary rates of pay. 
Members of the board, this is for our, our K-12 Fund 1 um, uh, area of finance, and the only change on this is for the temporary employee, as you see in the bottom location, again, due to uh, minimum wage law changes, we need to increase that to $9.86 per hour. We are making no other changes or recommendations to other changes at this time. So move. Second. Motion by Dale Boss, second by Krista Gettle to approve the updated sub um, and temp rate rates of pay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion is passed, 6-0. Uh, next we have a resolution for establishing combined polling places. I do want to make note, everyone, um, that this change came about through the Minnesota legislature and laws on that on an annual basis all school districts must do a resolution indicating their combined polling locations um, if they were ever to conduct an election on a day other than the general election. We have no intent of uh, having any type of election next school year um, as a school district. This is just simply meeting the requirements by the state that we annually designate where our combined polling locations would be, and we are meet, doing so to meet the law, not with any intent to have any kind of a vote. Resolution establishing combined polling places for multiple precincts and designating hours during which the polling places will remain open for voting for school district elections not held on the day of the statewide election. Be it resolved by the School Board of Independent School District number 2905, State of Minnesota, as follows. Pursuant to Minnesota Statute Section 205A.11, the precincts and polling places for school district elections are those precincts or parts of precincts located within the boundaries of the school district which have been established by the cities or towns located in whole or in part within the school district. The board hereby confirms those precincts and polling places so established by those municipalities. Pursuant to Minnesota Statute Section 205A.11, the board may establish a combined polling, polling place for several precincts for school district elections not held on the day of a statewide election. The following combined polling places are established to serve the precincts specified for all school district special and general elections not held on the same day as a statewide election. Combined polling place, Lonsdale City Hall, 415 Central Street, West Lonsdale, Minnesota, 55046. This combined polling place serves all territory of Independent School District 2905 located in the City of Lonsdale, Aaron Township, Forest Township, Shieldsville Township, and Wheatland Township. Combined polling place, Montgomery City Hall, 201 Ash Avenue West, Montgomery, Minnesota, 56069. The combined polling place serves all territory in Independent School District 2905 located in the City of Montgomery, Kilkenny, Kilkenny Township, Heidelberg, Lanesburg, Lanesburg Township, and Montgomery Township. Combined polling place, Lee Center City Hall, 10 West Tyrone, Lee Center, Minnesota, 56057. This combined polling place serves all territory at Independent School District 2905, located in the City of Lee Center, Cleveland <coughs> Township, Cordova Township, Derrynane Township, Elysian, Township, Lexington Township, and Sharon Township. Pursuant to Minnesota Statute Section 205A.09, the polling places will remain open for voting for school district elections not held on the same day as a statewide election between the hours of 7 o'clock a.m. and 8 o'clock p.m. The clerk is directed to file a certified copy of this resolution within the county auditors of each of the counties in which the school district <coughs> is located in whole or in part within 30 days after its adoption. As required by Minnesota Statute Section 204B.16, Division 1A, the clerk is hereby authorized and directed to give written notice of new polling place locations to each affected household with at least one registered voter in the school district <coughs> school district polling place location <coughs> has been changed. The notice was <coughs> in a non-forwardable no notice mailed at least 25 days before the date of the first election to which it will apply. A notice that is returned as undeliverable 
must be forwarded immediately to the appropriate <coughs> county auditor who shall change the registrant's status to challenge in the statewide registration system. Election judges shall be appointed to serve in each combined polling place. I need a second. Second it. Again, this will be a roll call vote. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Michelle? Yes. Dan? Yes. And Marsha is a yes. Um, Dan Rudd introduced the resolution. Ashley had seconded it, and it was unanimous. Roll call vote has passed. So appropriate that we end with the resolution for Dan's last. <laughs> <minute>. <laughs> Not even a short one. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just thinking, you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> 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 and Brenda uh, very uniquely placed it right at the end yeah. of the agenda. <laughs> Bravo, Brenda. <laughs> yeah, I'll seek a motion to adjourn the meeting. I will make that motion. <laughs> second. Motion by Dan Rudd, second by Michelle Borch to adjourn the meeting at 8.09 p.m. All those in favor? Aye. Those Aye. opposed? Motion is passed.